We're going to be joined now by David Lionhelm from the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, Senator, thanks for your time this morning. What are your responses to this latest iteration, I suppose, of a plan to ban the burqa in public buildings? There are a number of countries that are now doing that, banning the burqa and the niqab. And by that I mean the, the Islamic guard, uh, garb that cover your face. We're not talking about just the, the uh, gowns and, and things like that. Um, the, a number of countries have gone down this path, including France, um, and they're doing it for security reasons, because you can't see a person's face, and uh, if they're involved in a crime or you know, they need to be recognised for some reason, uh, then not being able to see their face is an issue. If you don't have a decent security reason, there is no justification for it. It's just uh, uh, prejudice. Um, and obviously it can only relate to those forms that cover the face. That's the only, only justification for interfering with what somebody wears. Right. So if it's going to be about security, presumably that would not apply to schools, would it? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, when does security apply? Um, in uh, uh, some Arabic countries now, and I think it's Morocco most recently, they're banning the burqas and uh, niqabs um, in, gen or in public uh, entirely. So there's obviously precedent for it, but you, know, you have to look at it on a situation-by-situation -situation basis. Uh, is a school a, uh, a, an environment where, you, where security is important? Probably it is, so perhaps uh, not allowing them under those circumstances might be uh, justifiable. I don't, I don't really want to sort of say black, it's black and white. It's not. There has to be a justification in every instance. OK, well, you know, let's not forget it. It applies to a very, very tiny percentage of the Australian population. But mm. moving on, David Lionhelm, Rod Carleton, I suppose you'd say it's been brief, it's been colourful. What have you made of his time in the Senate and the process by which he's eventually been, it looks as though, forced out now? Yes, I think he's gone. The horse is dead, although he, he continues to flog it uh, a little bit. But uh, uh, yes, I think uh, he's probably his pay has been stopped. I'd say his phone will stop in a, in a few days and uh, he won't have access to his office. Um, so what's it been like? He's been entertaining, to say the least. Um, I, I found him um, uh, affable. I got on fine with him at a personal level. But um, he is seriously obsessed about this banking issue um, and pursuing his own personal agenda. Almost everything he did um, was, look, he approached it through the prism of what's in it for me rather than what's in it for the people who voted for me and elected me. Um, he wanted to pursue the people who he owed money to using his uh, senator's uh, role, if you like. Um, there are many times when I sort of thought, I don't think that's an appropriate use of your, your senator's uh, responsibilities and power. And uh, so um, I think his party will be the most relieved of all to be uh, rid of him. I think they found him very frustrating. Um, it started in particular when uh, the High Court case uh, was commenced. He was offered uh, a lawyer by the government to argue his side that he was, shouldn't be disqualified on the grounds of his larceny. Uh, conviction. He refused. He said, uh, oh no, that, that would yeah. be like sleeping with the enemy. It was a crazy thing to do. And I realised that... It all that, seemed... I realised yeah, at so that it point that bit, it was going downhill, yeah. It all seemed a bit quixotic, didn't it? But I'm interested in what you think of Colin Barnett's move, because we know that the replacement for him, if this happens, needs to be approved by the WA Parliament, if indeed this isn't something that finds he was disqualified and then it's a recount. But what have you made of Colin Barnett saying, this has to be a suitable candidate and he won't just tick off on it as someone in a minor party that he wouldn't necessarily just allow One Nation to replace what Rod Culloden. I think his scope to do anything other than uh, approve the uh, candidate nominated by the One Nation party is very limited. There was a constitutional amendment put through after Joe Bjelke-Peterson did that to the Labor Party, when was it, back in the 70s or 80s, I can't remember now. Um, he put up a, um, a a candidate that he thought was suitable, but it, the party that uh, had lost the position didn't think was suitable, and there was a constitutional amendment after that. I don't think uh, Colin Barnett has much room to move on that. There is an issue, of course, as to whether or not One Nation will own that seat. That will be determined by the High Court when it considers whether that larceny charge or larceny conviction disqualified him right from the start. But just very quickly, even without the legal argument, whatever happens, I think the last time was around the time of the dismissal with Joe Bielke-Peterson, you would presumably not welcome Colin Barnett 
not allowing a minor party to have no. their choice. No, no, and I don't think he, I don't think he should on uh, moral grounds, and I don't think he can on legal grounds. I think he has to go with what, okay. with what no, One Nation chooses. The government's tax plan, we've been speaking about it this morning. Where is this at with you and some of your crossbench colleagues? Do you get a feel on where they're going to land on this? What's going to be possible to get past? Sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. So the government's company tax cut oh, plan. Oh, company tax cut plan, yes. Well, look, um, I, my view is that uh, it'll get blocked in the Senate because uh, uh, the Greens and Labor just think companies are bad, uh, big companies are especially bad, and they, they're convinced that none of them are paying enough tax and uh, it's, you know, uh, it's legitimate to, uh, to put taxes up, not down. Um, there are a number of the crossbenchers who think uh, 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 taxes on small businesses should be lowered, but not on big businesses. Um, there are also a, a number who think that uh, um, cutting taxes is good, but not cutting spending. So it's a bit of a, 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 bit of a, a mixture. Um, my view is yep. that we are overtaxed and that irrespective of what we do here locally, the situation of lo or the requirement to lower taxes will be forced on us. Trump is going to lower American taxes, the British are going to lower their taxes or have already, the rest of the world is moving to lower corporate taxes. If we don't lower our taxes, and they're already high by world standards, that's why everybody's moving to Singapore, um, if we don't do that, we're going to lose an awful lot of jobs. Okay, we'll see where that heads. I'm interested in, well, you know, the government's obviously working with the crossbench on this. Is there any particular pieces of legislation they're working at with you that they're trying to persuade you of over the summer season ahead of this new year? They've left me blissfully alone, I must say, um, over, the, <laughs> over the summer period. Um, no, they haven't been lobbying me at all. I'm, think, I'm thinking that they have prob uh, they've probably been working out what they regard as their priorities for, uh, for the February two-week sessions. Um, we probably won't find that out until the week after next. Um, there, is, okay. uh, there is, of course, the immigration bill that I think uh, they, they are at least going to talk about, uh, about uh, stopping um, boat, boat people from uh, settling in Australia. I wouldn't, have, wouldn't be surprised if they'd bring that one forward. Uh, finally, you, know, you caused a bit of a stir with comments on childcare workers. Your summary of their job was, I think, wiping noses and stopping children killing each other. Any regrets or clarifications after the fallout? Certainly no regrets, uh, but uh, a lot of people have taken it as a, as a reference to their job skills. That wasn't the point at all, and I'm sure there are lots of dedicated, qualified, uh, committed childcare workers out there, and uh, I wasn't, wasn't in any way denying their uh, commitment to their job or, the, or the, even the value of their job. The issue is who pays? That's the question. Who should pay for it? Now, thinking about why do we have childcare in the first place? It's primarily to allow mostly women to get back to work and have their kids minded and to know they're being carefully looked after while they're away. That's the purpose of it. And uh, from a public policy point of view, subsidising that, that uh, childcare so that the mum, mums can get back to work, so the women mm. uh, don't lose their skills, earn more money, pay taxes, you know, that's legitimate. But how much and should we subsidise teaching them algebra and Swahili while they're in childcare? You know, that's the question.